Our team arrives to meet Blood Bus Coordinator Tom Little Bear at about 4.15 a.m. on Wednesday, February the 1st, 2023. It's a little below zero degrees Celsius with roughly 50 km per hour winds. But when we arrive, the bus is already running and freshly cleaned. Tom arrives at 4.30 a.m. to begin his route. He's certainly no stranger to the bus. He used to ride as a grade one student attending St. Mary's in Lethbridge in the early 1960s. Later, as a grade 12 student, he actually drove all the students from the reserve, attended class during the day, and then drove everyone home. While he's had an assortment of careers since that time, he officially took over as the blood bus coordinator in 2014, when his late uncle, Alvin Crosschild, a founding member of the blood bus co-op, passed away. Pulling away around 4.44 in the morning, Tom makes his way from the well-lit streets of Lethbridge to Provincial Highway No. 3, headed west, and then turning south onto Highway 509. While the highway this morning is bright, clear, and relatively warm for winter, Tom notes that a number of factors, including cold temperatures, can impact the bus's ability to get the students to school safely. The coldest temperature, I um, would say, minus 35. That's uh, anything uh, um, over and above that um, we, we won't run. We, it's just not safe. It's just too cold for the children. We won't run. Just like just before Christmas when it got really cold, yes, a lot of our buses that tried to make uh, a run, a lot of them were breaking down. You know, education for the high school students, that's what, the little ones, they're okay, you know, elementary students, but for the high school students, we tried to get them to school in any way possible. Turning onto the gravel road maintained by the Blood Reserve near Wild Turnip Hill, Tom gives his daughter a quick call to let her know that we'll be arriving in about 30 minutes. As Tom explains, the Blood Reserve itself is a huge area that even he hasn't seen every part of. Do you feel like you know pretty much where everybody lives around here? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Except on that end, but you know, from this road and north and around here I, I pretty well know but I and there's places on the reserve I've never been to in my life could you believe that it's a big reserve this one 650 square miles yes we got the biggest reserve in Canada and on, like on our reserve you'll notice the families they kind of all live together like us guys the little bears, we all live down that one road. The medicine cranes, the brothers, sisters, they all live together. The day chiefs, they all live up there together. You know, like, must have been as a result, I think, of the clan system. Tom's first stop is actually to the site of his childhood home, where his grandparents had a one-room log cabin close to the river. He rebuilt in 1986, and his daughter, Melody Little Bear, and his grandsons, Brody and Badger, currently reside here. After warmly welcoming us all to her home and offering us food and beverages, Melody quickly resumes her morning routine, making lunches for the boys while she graciously answers all of our questions. Melody explains how her own early experiences on the bus have developed her current day organizational skills, skills that have served her very well at work as well as at home. She goes on to explain how preparation remains key for her and her family throughout the week. So as much as I could prep the night before, which is not too much because by the end of the day, you know, they leave at six, they're back at about five, quarter after five. So they've been gone a full, pretty much 12 hours. So by the time they get back, we're eating supper and then from there, um, it's the routine, they either take a shower or they're doing homework or they're watching TV. And then everybody usually is in bed by 8.30. Not because of routine, but usually we just fall asleep by that time because I think everybody is just so exhausted. But in the summertime, springtime, it's a little bit later, right? Because the days are longer, so yeah. But that's pretty much it, prepping the night before. Um, so I don't have um, drinking water you know, so that's why you'll notice a lot of water bottles and I've got water there. Um, I'm okay to do dishes and cleaning up with water here, um, but to drink it, we can't. 
right? So I've been dealing with the water issue and I see that all over with First Nations communities in Canada. And I'm one as well. I'm a household that cannot utilize my water and haven't for some, some time now. I would say maybe about 10 years, maybe even longer, yeah. Um, only because there's so much alkaline in the water and um, you know, it just wasn't a good fit for us. So as soon as we knew that it was okay to start drinking bottled water, bringing water jugs in, that's what we do. So a lot of it is prep and getting organized. So going with the water issue, I don't do laundry here. So I'm at the laundry mat on Saturdays or Sundays in Lethbridge or Fort McLeod doing a hundred bags of laundry. <laughs> so everybody is good to go for the week, including myself and yeah. Yeah, so that's usually how it goes. Weekends are prep for everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. and a lot of fancy paper plates too. <laughs> With all of the extra preparation required, we wanted to know why Melody chose to send her children to Lethbridge for their education. But I believe that they really support them. And um, that was a reason why I wanted to send my children there because not only will they receive a good education but they'll also receive the fundamentals of structure organization and then also build up that confidence they get courage through first nations workers such as billy mm -hmm. and then also you know they gain compassion for each other you know going to school with other races other children non-native um, you know, he's got a lot of friends in school. I have nothing against our education system. I love KBE. I was a board member um, during my university years and I would support uh, Kainai Board of Education in whatever way I can. My children have gone through there for Head Start, Kindergarten and some for Grade 1. And then from there, they usually follow their brothers or sisters. Yeah, just kind of follow suit. So yeah. A little after 6 a.m., we're back on the road so that Tom can continue his route. Good he greets morning, every student morning. by name and sprays them with yes. hand sanitizer to reduce the spread of germs, good. a practice that started during the COVID-19 pandemic. Oh, okay. I'll give that to Del. Your hands. Say good morning to the ladies, girls. Good morning, little Evie. I like your jacket. With the early morning winter darkness and bumpiness of the gravel roads, the morning ride is actually quite quiet, as most of the children are trying to catch a little bit more sleep before they arrive to school. In the meantime, Tom is taking care to avoid animals and getting stuck in large drifts of snow. Varying weather patterns and road conditions are a constant reality for him as he traverses the large... Oh, geez, we're lucky we made it through. Or else Badger would be shoveling. And this is the one I was telling you guys where I come to 1000, um, 1012 to get, I start counting from here, 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004, 1005, 1006, 1007, 1008, 1009, 1010, 1011, 1012. I know I'm close. That's the one that gets really foggy and you can't see turnoffs. We went through that twice already this year. And there's times I pick them up and I have to drive back up my bus all the way back to the road. And this little curve is a challenging one when you're backing up. You tend to start sliding into the ditch. Alvin, the late Alvin Crosschild, he had to pull me out twice from here. This is where I get stuck, right in this little spot. Because, you know, I can't, I don't have speed and... At the next house, Tom laughs because the door is wide open. We usually wait sometimes two minutes, but with certain students, um, sometimes it ends up being five minutes. Morning, they open the door, that's their trick. And so we can't leave once that door is open because we know they're going to school. Mm -hmm. Our policy with the bus co-op is, um, if the student doesn't get in touch with us and we, we've, um, we've um, gone to their residence three times, after the third time we don't go because, you know, what's the use of going 
to a house where nobody's getting on. You know, it's just a waste of your time. The time wasted going to a house with no rider makes it easy to understand why Tom appreciates when families contact him to let him know when plans change. He also appreciates being able to reach out to the families when he requires their assistance getting their children to school. And this road, I try to get away from it when it gets really bad. And that's the good thing about the parents. I'll phone them and I'll tell them, could you bring your, could you bring your, your child to the road? And they'll be parking over where the turnoff is. At a windy 7.33 a.m., Tom arrives at Weasel Fat Flats. This is where the drivers meet for students to transfer. This is where we do our transfers. These are blood buses that are taking students from Lethbridge to um, Standoff, to Kainai High and the middle school, elementary school. There's three of them, three buses that come out of Lethbridge. And there's a driver that comes all the way from the reserve, pick, heads into Lethbridge. I usually meet him halfway by, um, halfway, you know, from here to, to um, standoff. And as you can tell, with the kind of winds we have, we always have problems with our doors, especially these electric kind of doors, remote control doors, because of the fact that the wind gets to them and, you know, just about rips them off. I've already had to get my um, door fixed a couple of times because of the wind. Leaving promptly at 7.40 a.m., it's a straight shot from the Weasel Fat Blatt's transfer spot back to Lethbridge so that Tom can get the majority of his students to school before their 8 a.m. start time. When he pulls into his first drop-off location around the hub at a Cole St. Mary, St. Francis Junior High School, and Catholic time Central High up, School, get Tom gets on the loudspeaker and announces to all the students that it's time to get up and start their day. As the students exit the bus, he wishes them all a good day. Good morning. Good morning, Athena. For us, Tom has arranged to have a few precious minutes to meet and connect with some of the other blood bus drivers who talk about the blood bus co-op and their experiences. We have, uh, we do five school divisions, the Livingston, West Wind, the public and separate in Lethbridge and also on the reserve. We have about 60 routes that we do and uh, it's a real uh, tedious task that we do every day to keep these kids going. And what's the biggest reward that I have is um, seeing these kids uh, right from kindergarten to grade 12, they graduate, they go to university. And I'll tell you maybe a little story. Um, I guess this coming, this is what's Alvin's story. You know, uh, Calvin's brother, he passed away a couple of years ago, three years ago. He used to say, yeah, I went to a graduation. The student got up and said, oh, I graduated. If it wasn't for my mom, my dad waking me up, I'll never be able to graduate. And in the crowd, Alvin was saying to himself, what? If it wasn't for me bringing you to school every day, you wouldn't graduate. I went through all the mud, snow, and you know, which is true, hey? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, name's Calvin Crosschild, and it's been a, a pleasure with uh, the kids. I get to see them every day, and right from kindergarten, right when they graduate. I get to know them personally. <laughs> and they, 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 they're very interesting to know that they'll tell you the secrets of their home. Yeah, <laughs> the fights the, with the mom and dad. Uh, basically, you just grow with them. So that's awesome. Oh, I would say the challenging is just uh, driving the bus through harsh road conditions. Weather is a big factor, like today was a real uh, challenging. I just about didn't make it this morning, but uh, I was going downhill. I went through uh, about good three, four feet of, but it wasn't that very long. Well, it was about quarter mile, the big, uh, other than that, it was small. So those challenges would be the road. Uh, challenging is timing, trying to get them on time. I mean, uh, on tra uh, traffic on Highway 3, oh, that's dangerous. 
that's some, that's always something that we're going to be very careful especially the hills the hill uh, the hoop, hoop up and then the main highway three bridge very slick mm -hmm. so there's a lot of challenges <laughs> i just named a few well um you know seeing them growing up um and you, you know they um you, you that relation become relationship becomes very strong you know like most of some of these students like i said before they um they um how would we say it um they don't have a father figure in their lives so as, as bus drivers we you know we get that we you know they they come they get that bond that bonding builds that relationship you know bonding with the the student and you see them growing up right till when they're um you know they graduate and that relationship even after graduating they still say hello to us they're still like very you know very um that relationship is still there and it's always good when i'm walking through the mall or some i'm um, walking in a in a crowded place and all of somebody somebody says hey bus driver hi you know after dropping the majority of the students off at the lethbridge school hub tom continues his route dropping students off at catholic central high school west father leonard van Teagum, children of saint martha and nicholas sharon schools he finishes his last drop off at about 8:45 a.m and then takes a small break to have some breakfast and catch up on some of his other official duties as a Blackfoot elder, providing both spiritual and cultural guidance in the greater community. We meet Tom again at 10.30 a.m., and he brings us to his next stop at a Cole St. Mary. Here he watches closely for two kindergartners who are dismissed at a little after 11 a.m. He makes sure to go directly to the school's doors to greet the teacher and the children, and then he brings them by the hand safely back to the bus. Once boarded, the girls quickly make use of having the whole bus to themselves. They play, have a little something to eat, and rest before Tom delivers each of them back to their homes. He notes that if they weren't being distracted by us and our questions, they probably would have been asleep for a long time already. Tom also likes to take these opportunities to teach the children a few words in Blackfoot. So they're starting to know these simple words. Mm. Yeah. Okay means come on yeah let's go let's go and yeah meet the kid hurry up throughout this scenic afternoon leg in tom's journey the weather continues to be quite bright and clear and we have a chance to see what the roads we faced in the morning are really like it's a little more disconcerting in some spots to realize how much of an incline there was or how close to a ravine we actually were Mom, quarter after six in the morning on the road. And, you know i couldn't see the edges i just had to just you certain um, things like I know, like this is the edge of this hill. That's where the road goes. So that's where I was just waiting for. It was all quite out. Yeah. So this road gets pretty bad. And this time, it's like I'm surprised the snow drifts. They they, they go right over this part of the hill. The snow drifts. conditions, Tom also talks about how hard the gravel, ice, and in the spring, mud are on the buses. As these vehicles are more intended for paved highways and city streets, they tend to break down much faster than typical for the blood bus drivers. Most of these buses, they're not designed for these kind of roads. They're designed for highway and stuff. Since each of the blood bus drivers owns their own bus, they are essentially responsible for ensuring that it is gassed up, cleaned, and well-maintained. 
With the rising cost of diesel, the basic weekly expenditures for driving a bus are already fairly significant. Tom says that generally he fills up two to three times per week at a rate of roughly $250 to $350 for a tank, depending on the price of fuel. He also explains that he encourages all of the bus drivers to take pride in their buses and to keep them clean. I really try to instill them. I tell them, for some reason, I don't know why, but I tell them, Southland is our competition. We got to keep up with them. I don't want them to say, oh, that's a blood bus, it's just covered with mud, you know. So I try to get them to take pride in, the, in their bus, keeping them clean. But how often I wash my bus, at least, if, if, it's, if the weather is really bad, then I'll have to wash it at least once a week. But when it's good, when it's not, you know, no, um, the bus stays clean, I usually wash it once a month. Yesterday's wash, to wash the bus inside and out, it cost over a hundred. Arriving back in Lethbridge a little after 1 p.m., Tom takes another short break. He meets us again at around 3 p.m. so that he can start collecting students to bring them home after the school day. He begins at Father Leonard Van Tegen's school and says that he has to pick the student up a little earlier than he would prefer in order to make operations run smoothly for everyone else. He notes that he is really grateful to the schools for how helpful and accommodating they are when this is unavoidable. Later in the afternoon, when they weren't as sleepy, we took the opportunity to talk to the students about their bus experiences. I'm not saying I like being in a car or bus for long, but like I like the view when, okay. on our way back. Yeah. What's your least favorite part about being on a bus? Um, it kind of being bumpy. What do you like the best about being on a bus? Uh, sleeping. Like to sleep too? Yeah. And what is the worst thing about being on a bus? Uh, okay, so I hate when it bumps when I'm trying to sleep. I hate like kids like crawling under me and like going up among me. The best thing about being on the bus in the morning, or being on the bus at all? Um, I get sleep. And what do you find the most challenging thing about being on the bus? Um, that you have to wake up so early. Despite the long trip, many of the students said they were happy to attend their school in Lethbridge and indicated that the trip is worthwhile. I like how um, big it is. There's a lot of things to do, a lot of people to meet. Um, I like how many classes they have, different things you can do, how they can also teach you, um, like how they have job interviews and all that, like teach you all that stuff. So when I, when I was in grade, um, grade two, I didn't know how to read or count or do my ABCs. Mm -hmm. So I had to go to grade two in Lethbridge and I did every, like, I know my numbers, math, and kind of reading. So it's better in Lethbridge, I guess. Though there is a lot to be said for coming into Lethbridge, some of the older students noted that traveling up to two hours a day over difficult roads and bumpy terrain certainly makes school a challenge. Because it's not like regular buses like here in Lethbridge. They'll get back to their house in like within the hour or like not even the hour. They'll get back in like 20 minutes. But for us, we have an hour to Lethbridge in the morning and then an hour back to our houses or sometimes even longer. One of my friends doesn't get back to their house till around 6 or 6.30. And it's really hard because we can't do like extracurriculars after school because we have to catch the bus or else we have no ride back. And it's hard because I have to do stuff at my house. Like I have to clean and I cook because my grandma does dialysis. So she's too tired. And my auntie, she doesn't really do anything. So I kind of take care of my siblings and me. It can be really tiring like getting up so early in the morning and then sitting there and like depending on how you can sleep, you can either sleep on the bus, but depending on how many kids are on the bus, you can't, or, and then all the way in, and then after school having to deal with homework and then getting all the way home, and then you can't really do the homework on the bus, it's really hard, and you can't even read it because it practically looks like chicken scratch, and then getting home, usually you have like plans, like having to do chores, a bunch of other things, so it's hard to be able to fit everything into 
a timely manner to get everything done and not be stressed about it and not having to like on the verge of a panic attack trying to get this done trying to get that done because your parents want something done or you, t or you need a assignment due and it's it can be stressful because how much time you spend on the bus just sitting there for like two hours and then like i've had teachers where they weren't really all that lenient on it and it was so so stressful and it was really hard i like to the point where I like almost started avoiding coming to school. Like I had come up with excuses not to come to school because it was easier to stay at home than it was to come to school and deal with that than trying to explain why I can't do it because the bus rides so long. And then they're just always the answers. Why can't you do it at home? Well, I don't have a lot of time. Well, I'll make time. I'm just like, ah, well, it's hard. They sometimes teachers just seem like they don't want to understand. I hope they will understand what the res kids have to deal with every day and what the struggles they have. Like they can't do homework on the bus or like at home it's really difficult because they get home late and they have to wake up so early. When asked what he thought school staff should know about a day in the life of the blood bus drivers and their students, Tom had some clear and insightful points to share. Um. Well, number one is I'd like to um, um, uh, um, talk about uh, the determination of these students, you know, getting up at that time, you know, and um, yes, I, that would, um, would be probably my number one is the determination and the effort that these students put in to get up and to make it to school here in Lethbridge. And number two is the elements that we're up against the weather, the roads, you know, all those factors. I'd, want they, uh, I'd like them to understand why sometimes our buses don't show up when there's, you know, because of the fact that roads are so bad, terrible. And even we've gone to the f point where sometimes we just pick up the high school students. Gathering all of his students after school, the bus leaves Lethbridge at around 3.50 p.m. Tom makes his first drop-off at 4.30. He finishes delivering the final student home at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and then begins the sixth and final leg of his journey back to Lethbridge. As we travel, Tom notes that, yet again, another weather pattern is coming in, further darkening the sky. Fortunately, the weather holds until we arrive back at St. Martha Parish at exactly 6.01 p.m., completing a total of 451 kilometers over the three collective trips spanning 13 hours. Tom's final thoughts for the day are of appreciation and hope. Um, I'm very um, honored to be asked to do what I did today with you ladies. For you to real, you know, to, um, how would we say it, to have, to experience what we go through on a daily basis. You know, it's so awesome what you guys did, you know, today, so in the future, you know, people will know what an average day for some of our students are and are, the, like I say, I always say, the elements that we're up against. Tom is not the only one to express appreciation. The students also recognize the daily commitment required by our bus drivers. I'm just thankful that they're, like, supportive and stuff, and then the bus drivers get me to and from school each day and stuff like that. I would say I'm really grateful that they're taking us to school every day, that they're making the commitment, even when the roads are like really terrible, that they're still going and driving the bus every day and doing all that. And I'm really grateful for Delvin. He's been driving for my family for a well over 10 years. Well, um, for all of my brothers. Uh, um, yeah. Just really grateful for them that they're driving us to school, having to make that um, commitment. Especially Tom, him having to wake up so early. Yeah. Clearly, this single snapshot of a day in the life of our blood bus drivers cannot possibly encompass everything. We know that the conditions on the reserve can change quickly and drastically throughout the school year. For instance, some of the students shared some photos they had taken of the roads in the spring, when snowdrifts shifted to mud bogs. 
What is obvious is that the job our blood bus drivers do is essential to the future success of our students traveling from the reserve into leverage, and that it requires a great deal of skill, sound judgment, commitment, and a heart for children. We are truly grateful.